Welcome to this new faith group's study. Blessed is the one who reads the prophecy, the meaning and message of Revelation. Our last faith group study, Let the Reader Understand, concluded with a session on Revelation, but it was really just a quick overview that gave a general approach and a way to read the book. And since then, a number of people have expressed their interest in a more thorough study of Revelation. Now, it's really not surprising. Revelation is a source of enduring fascination in the church. Its strange symbolism and fantastic scenes are just captivating. Its promises for the future are equal parts threatening and assuring. It offers some of the very few glimpses of heaven described anywhere in the Bible. But what has fascinated people the most, I think, is Revelation's predictions of the future. From the day it was written, people have read this book to try to determine a timetable of future events. And it's easy to do because the strange symbolism yields to all sorts of applications. But it's also really hard to do because who knows which of those applications is actually right. And so this effort to use Revelation to unlock the future has kept all sorts of preachers and teachers gainfully employed down through the years. But it's a hopeless task because that is not Revelation's purpose. Although the book does have a future cast to it, Revelation was written to speak to the present situation of the churches that received it. It is not, and never was, a blueprint of future events. And part of the proof of that is that it can be made to apply to any historical time or period. And yet, not surprisingly, none of those applications ever pans out as promised. Now, on the other hand, the present situation of those churches that received Revelation was so threatening that they wondered if reality, if the future, is really under God's control or not. And so in that sense, the main crucial issue in Revelation is this. Who is Lord? By all appearances, Caesar, the Roman Empire, was holding all the cards. And in contrast, Jesus had ascended into heaven, never come back, and now his followers were being persecuted and martyred, or they were losing hope, or they were compromising with the world in order to get along and go along. Well, in contrast to all that, John is shown that Jesus, crucified and risen, is actually Lord. And you know, that's still the crucial issue for us today. We don't deal with Caesar, thank God, but we face many other competing lords. And as Christianity struggles from decay within and persecution without, we too may well worry that the devil and the world have the upper hand. So Revelation still works to assure us too that Jesus is Lord. And, spoiler alert, he wins in the end. In fact, that's John's claim for the book, which gave the title to this series. In the opening paragraph, he writes, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it. Now note well, he did not say, Blessed is the one who figures out the prophecy. Revelation isn't a secret code to be cracked or solved. In fact, all the strange symbolism, as weird as it seems, described the real world in which John's readers lived. And once we could understand that, then we're able to see how it also applies to our world that we live in now. And so Revelation is meant to comfort and encourage, not to confuse or frighten. 
And so our prayer for all of you as you launch into this study is that you will be blessed as you read the words of the prophecy. And with that, let's delve into this fascinating revelation that John received. That description is deliberate and important. The revelation that John received. This isn't something John made up. It's not creative writing, but he received this revelation. The opening verse of the book says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending an angel to his servant, John. So this book is not John's insight or teaching, but it came from Jesus Christ. And yet Jesus wasn't the original source of it either. Nor did he give it directly to John. God gave it to Jesus, who gave it to the angel, who gave it to John. The angel is a messenger, one who carries word from God to his people. And the angel guides John all the way through the book, through all the revelations that he sees. At the same time, though, it's interesting to note that we aren't able to see what John saw. That's why he said, blessed is the one who reads the words of the prophecy. So this is John's writing. It's his account and description of what he was shown. John is the author, but the ideas and the descriptions are not his, but reflect what God showed to him. And there's something else to note. John says he received a revelation, but he calls his book a prophecy. Now this is not prophecy in terms of future predictions. Actually, most biblical prophecy doesn't really concern future predictions. But rather, like the prophets, John is delivering a message from God to his people. And that's why reading and hearing this prophecy is so crucial, so that we get the message that God showed to John through his messenger, so that we might hear it and know it. But finally, note that John specifically says, the one is blessed who reads aloud the words of the prophecy. Well, that doesn't mean we have to read it aloud to ourselves when we go through the book, but what it does indicate is that this was meant to be read in the churches, in worship, to be shared with the Christian community. It's a message from Christ that everyone needs to hear. Now, as we move further into chapter one, John names himself as the writer of this book. And it's long been assumed that this John was John, the disciple of Jesus, the son of Zebedee. And that's not impossible. You know, one intriguing thing about Revelation is that it's written in horrible Greek, as if it was a second language, which it would have been for John, who would have grown up speaking Aramaic. But there's every reason to think that John was written at the very end of the first century, probably the mid-90s AD, which would have made John, Jesus' disciple, very elderly. So there's no way to know for sure, but it's more likely that it's some other John, and John was a very common name. What's more important to note is that the seven churches that receive Revelation know John. At some level, they recognize his authority as he serves among them. And in fact, we know that one of the recognized offices in the early church was that of prophet. And that may have been John's function in the church. He was a prophet. And so now he delivers this prophecy to the churches where he worked. Now, as John greets his readers, we run into the first mysterious symbol in the book. Along with God the Father and Jesus, he mentions the seven spirits who are before his throne. 
Well, who or what are the seven spirits? Well, it could relate to the seven churches that received revelation, but more likely, it's an unusual description of the Holy Spirit. Because that completes the Trinitarian reference in this greeting, the Father, the Son, and now the Holy Spirit. And seven indicates fullness or completeness of God's Spirit. And if this is the implication, it's influenced by Old Testament imagery. As much of the book of Revelation is, as John writes down his descriptions, it's very clear that he has uh, the, the Old Testament scriptures bouncing around in his head and is making use of that imagery over and over again. Well, in chapter 1, verse 8, then, the greeting to his readers closes with a direct word from God for the first of only two times in the whole book of Revelation. The other, in almost identical words, is in the very last chapter, chapter 22. And the two statements serve like bookends around the revelation that John has given. I am the Alpha and the Omega, God says. And Alpha and Omega are the A and the Z of the Greek alphabet. So God is the beginning and the end, before, after, above, and around all other things. The pagan gods of the Greeks to the one true God revealed in Jesus Christ. And it's not the last time that that kind of switch will be made in the book of Revelation. Well, then in verse 9, John begins to describe how he received this revelation that he's about to write down. First, he calls himself your brother which in the early church was the key way of describing a fellow Christian. He's a member of the church with his readers who receive this. That also establishes common ground with his readers. And then he goes further and describes their common experiences in three ways. They share in persecution for their Christian faith. They are all members of God's kingdom through Christ Jesus. And the word kingdom echoes over against Caesar and his kingdom. And they're all patiently enduring this time of suffering. Next, we learn that John was on the island of Patmos, which was a prison island, sort of like Alcatraz. Patmos was 37 miles off the west coast of what was called Asia Minor. Today, we call it Turkey. And John says he was there because of the word of God, and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, he's been imprisoned for his faith, for his preaching and his testimony that Jesus is Lord. And it really verifies his earlier claim that he shares in the persecution with his readers. And then in verse 10, John just relates how this revelation came to him. It was clearly an ecstatic experience, a visionary, uh, maybe even a trance uh, setting that fell upon him. So this is not, I mean, this falls outside normal human experience and senses. It's not information that was available to anyone unless God chooses to deliver it to him. And it happened on the Lord's day. That's Sunday, because Sunday is the day that the Lord was raised from the dead. And that implies that John received this vision while he was worshiping God on the Lord's day. That is, he devoted himself to worship. God used that moment to open up this revelation uh, that was beyond perception otherwise. And as he worshiped, John said he heard a loud voice indicating divine authority, a voice that told him to write to seven churches. And so we've seen already the book of Revelation is a revealing. It's been called a prophecy, but now it's also a letter, an epistle written to churches, just as Paul wrote his letters to the churches he founded. 
It's not clear why God chose these particular seven churches. Perhaps John was known to them or served in them. We do know they all fell along the same highway or trade route through Western Asia Minor. But it's also clear that while they were the immediate recipients, Revelation was meant for a much wider audience too, including you and me. Well, the last part of the introduction to Revelation records the first of John's many visions, and it's just loaded with meaning. First, he says he saw seven golden lampstands, maybe something like this. Now, later on, those lampstands are identified as the seven churches who received Revelation. But I think they represent more the presence of the Holy Spirit in those churches. From Pentecost day on, the Spirit has been identified with flame and with fire. And so as the lamps burn in those churches, the Holy Spirit is present there. And John says that one like the Son of Man was in the midst of those seven golden lampstands. And that's what the Holy Spirit does brings one like the Son of Man into our presence, makes him present to us. Now, as you read through this part of uh, Revelation chapter 1, note that as John tries to describe this vision, how often he uses words like, such as like or as. The vision clearly defies description. No words will quite do. And he's struggling to come up with something that's as close as he can get to try to get across how awesome this vision was. There's an overwhelming sense of glory, majesty, of, of divinity beyond what we can ever know in this world. Well, then in verse 16, he sees this one like a son of man is holding seven stars in his right hand. Now, in Greek thought, the seven stars were the sun, the moon, and the five known planets. So we would not call them stars, but they were understood at that time to be stars. And in the pagan world, those were often worshipped as gods. But John knows they're not gods. And so the one, like the Son of Man, holds them in his right hand. He has authority over them. And indeed, it was through him that all things were made. And then finally he says, a sharp two-edged sword came out of his mouth. The two sharp edges signify both his power to forgive and to save, to condemn and to release. But of course it also echoes another passage in Hebrews chapter 4. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So the vision John sees also reflects the two functions of God's word as law and gospel. And as John is about to tell his vision, it suggests that this word will both critique and comfort, accuse and forgive, condemn and save. Well, as you can well imagine, John was so blown away by this awesome sight that he fell as though dead. That's a typical reaction to the, to the appearance of God throughout the Bible, because it's simply so overwhelming. But then note how this glorious figure, one like the Son of Man, reacts to him. He placed his hand on him. The power of touch. He's not some distant, far-off figure who will have nothing to do with this uh, person who's been blown away. But he touches him and then says, do not be afraid. Just as messengers and angels throughout the Bible do, their first word is, do not be afraid. God has come not to destroy, but to bless and to save. So he pours out compassion, reassurance, comfort, and promise on John. 
And now, as all of this unfolds, only at this point do we learn for sure who this figure is, this one like the Son of Man. In, chapter 18, in verse 18 of chapter 1, he tells John, I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I have the key of death and of Hades. Hades was the place of the dead. Well, there is only one who was dead and has been raised to live forever and ever, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, it's interesting that in the Old Testament, all of this kind of language in John's description is reserved for the God of Israel alone. Now it's applied to Jesus Christ. And so the key implication here is that God the Father and Christ the Son are one. And Christ then tells John to write what is and what is to take place later. And that clearly shows that Revelation concerns the present, not just the future. And that's exactly how the book unfolds. What comes next are the letters to the seven churches that reveal the present condition of those churches, both good and bad. And only in that light then, do the visions move on to what will happen soon? And so next time we'll explore those seven letters, the situation of the churches in John's day, and how they reflect on the church now.